Try to capture as much as you can. I think theater is such an ephemeral art. We want to try to hold on to it whatever way. And we're not saying an archival video is as good. But, you know, when I'm trying to tell people, you know, even, okay, even though we have a movie now of the great long day's journey into night they did at Stratford a few years ago, it wasn't the same as being in the theater and seeing the moment near the end of the first act when everybody suddenly realized what mom was doing and their faces all, you know, it was great. It was brilliant. You had to be there. And maybe that video could have showed you that moment. And if you went back and read a review where someone said, you know, the moment at the end of the first act where the brothers finally and the father realized mom was on the morphine again, and you look at the video and go, look at that. Look what Martha Henry just did. Look what Tom McCamus did. Look what Bill Hutwood did. Look what Peter Donaldson did. That's brilliant. It might give you an insight. So the more information we can lay down on tape, audio tape, video tape, digital, Xerox, anything to kind of put all this together. And again, we have to not be judgmental. We can't just say we'll do the good shows because who knows what the good shows are. You know, sometimes you may want to see a show that was not heralded as good to find out what it was like originally or what so-and-so was like early on in their career. Uh, you know, and, and that can be a riveting thing as well. So the more we can lay down for us to look at in generations to come, the better. You know, we're talking about two different things, aren't we, really, or, or two aspects of the same thing, an archive and, for want of a better word, an entertainment. I mean, something you sort of have to apply to take out of a back room, whether it's a, an old play script or a video or something you, you walk around looking at. And I, to my shame, I've never been to the Theatre Museum in London, but from what Lynn said, the, the fault seems to be more in how, how it's been arranged than in what has been arranged, because you made the actual exhibit sound, sound rather interesting. Um, and I suspect the archi I suspect the, the archival value is the greater. Uh, I think there's probably a limited amount you can get from walking around an exhibition of costume designs and set designs and old programs, which is really well. I suppose no act actual costumes, but unlikely to be actual sets. Uh, but that's um, all you can actually hope to actually hang in 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 a museum that people can walk around. Uh, I think, um, I think the video aspect now is very important. I like to think it's not all important. One of the, um, those composers with three names, right, all the off-Broadway musicals these <laughs> days, I, I, I forget which one it was, said he thought that uh, the advent of videos of productions had, had meant that critics were no longer any use. You, didn't, you, don't, you no longer need to read critics to find out what it was like to see a show 50 years ago or 100 years ago or whatever. Um, or you won't when, when they are 50 or 100 years old. Uh, and I'd like to think he was wrong. I'd like to think that there is, um, the two things might be complementary, that you still need to read what somebody f thought and felt and described about what the experience was um, in conjunction with the seeing what is, after all, going to be a rather blurred and unsatisfactory version of it, uh, probably shot from just one point of view when an audience in a theater, by definition, has a choice of several points of view. Uh, so I, I guess I, I'd forgotten about the Billy Rose. It's wonderful. I tend to, I tend to go there usually to, to look up scripts of very old musicals and to, to realize just, just how bad they were. But, it's, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's nice to have that resource. It's nice to have actually as much information about anything because uh, you never know when it's going to come in useful. So um, I think that's probably um, the, what a theater museum would be most important for. And we're lucky. We're starting pretty much at the beginning. I mean, 60 years is nothing. So um, we don't have, you know, th there is not that much in Canadian theatre that is beyond retrieval. So 100 years from now, none of us will be here to judge it, but <laughs> it could be wonderful. Well, we're going to open it up now for uh, questions from the audience. So. The question is, do you read a play before you go see it? Oh, my God. Um, it would ne he, our good friend Kamal, Al Sulali, uh, he insists on reading the play first. I think that's wonderful. I would prefer to see it fresh without, uh, without having any preconceived notions about it so that you can you can look at it like an audience does and and it's a real challenge to see does it work does it not work what doesn't work how come it doesn't work you're asking the same questions that an audience would and you're looking at it 
with your critical faculties as well. So, you, you know, you're in both camps. So, innocent eye test, why doesn't this work? How come the guy doesn't say, sell me your painting? Why am I going through one whole act in which everybody is running around the, running around the question but not asking the question? So I think I can get that in the performance. What is working in the performance? It, the, 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 the play is just one element of it on the, on the, on the printed page. I want to look at the production full on and, and fresh. I agree totally. I never read a new script before I go to see it. I absolutely refuse to. I want to be in the same position the audience is in, seeing it for the first time. In fact, I often regret when I'm going to see my 92nd Midsummer Night's Dream that it's my 92nd Midsummer Night's Dream. I often wish I was in the position of the high school kid who's seeing it for the first time. Uh, so if they told me they didn't think that was a particularly funny bottom, they were probably really right, whereas I'm going, oh, well, that's funny. Not as funny as Bedford was five years ago. It's funnier than Dinical was three years ago. <laughs> you know, and that's sometimes, unfortunately, you do that, although they say, you know, comparisons are odorous. Uh, you're not supposed to do them. But I would never read a new play. Uh, I also don't even try to have the script around. People, at, this is this will tie in with another question. They ask you, do you take notes? Because I file immediately. The only thing you will ever see me write down in the theater is a line of a play or a line of a lyric from a new script that I want to use either to praise it or condemn it. So if you ever see me writing in the theater, you'll notice, if you'll never see me writing anything down at a Shakespeare or an Edward Albee or a Sondheim musical, because I presume I know the text. If not, I have it sitting back at my desk. But if you see me scratching something in the dark, it's a line from a new script. And as I said, I'm using it to either praise it or crucify it. And that's what it's there for. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, when I write something down, it's usually a, a line of dialogue. I sometimes will try and write down something descriptive, so I, you know, but so, what, how something looked like or something an actor did so I can um, describe it better afterwards. But usually what I write down are lines of dialogue that have struck me. It doesn't really matter really because I can never read my own handwriting afterwards. But uh, I, I, do, I do have this, this feeling that if I write it down, it will somehow stay in my memory. And it's funny the amount of time I managed to go on believing this even though it's been too <laughs> demonstrably false time after time after time. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm in total agreement. I'm, I, I don't want to. I don't want to read play. Years ago, years and years ago, in a former life, I wrote the program notes for the first production of Tom Stoppard's Jumpers at the National Theatre, and um, I had to read the play in advance. Actually, strictly speaking, I needn't have done, because, one, because uh, my mandate or my instruction was I must not give away anything about the play, whatever. So apart from a, a, a one sort of private joke I got in in the last line, I didn't, but I had read the play. And it's one of the funniest plays ever written. I think probably the wittiest play in English since The Importance of Being Earnest. And I, well, I, I, was, I was glad to have the opportunity to do it. I was quite pleased with what I wrote. But when I, I cursed the fact that I wasn't actually hearing the jokes fresh the first night I saw them. Uh, and, I mean, and on a comedy especially, you know, I, I, like, to be taken, I like to be taken by surprise, uh, espe especially by humor. And I not that anybody writes thrillers anymore, but I guess I'd like to be, 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 be taken by surprise by twists in a narrative. But I do find, and this may be inconsistent, if it's a classic that I haven't seen before, which of course is a rarer and rarer occurrence as I get older, uh, I would like to read it in order to try and fit it into its historical context. I somehow feel that that is part of what I'm being asked to pronounce on. Um, it also help, I guess it just helps me in, in, in some ways to have more to say. But that a production of a classic comes to you with a certain context built in. I mean, no matter how avant-garde the production is trying to be, actually, the more avant-garde it's trying to be, probably the more you should be aware of the context, because frankly, what the director is saying is, look at how different this can be, so you better know, how, you know what it's supposed to be being different from. Um, I, I don't know I could, I could make a, a really logical claim for that. You know, after all, if I'd never read Hedda Gabler before, wouldn't it be, or seen, or seen Hedda Gabler before, wouldn't it be a good idea to go and see it fresh for once? But... Uh, on the whole, that, that, that's not how I operate. But uh, I do like you to, to be able to read a play afterwards. Um, I mean, not having Richard's deadline, I have a little bit more time for that. And so, so I don't you know, get it horribly wrong and be unfair to the play and much less importantly, unfair to myself. I wouldn't mind having a, a copy of the play with me and sometimes be quite frank. There are things I don't understand and would, would, would like to, you know, would like to have an, a second shot at understanding or if I've if I've nodded off at some point because the play's been so boring, you know, who knows? Maybe something terribly good went on and I better know about it. Uh, and also, of course, it does give you some idea, some way of distinguishing between the text and the production, although even with the play in front of you, that's not all that easy. So, 
yeah, I have, so to speak, a double standard. But no, I, I wouldn't want to read a play beforehand. Actually, I'd.